You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 157A, entitled Spiritual Life Now and After Death, Forming Our Destiny in the Physical and Spiritual World. Six lectures given in Berlin from the November 16th to December 21st, 1915 by Rudolf Steiner. Lecture one is uh, entitled Spiritual Life Now and After Death. My dear friends, this evening I am deeply satisfied to be with you again after a long absence. Let us first direct our thoughts once more toward the areas where great events are taking place today and in which so many of our dear fellow human beings must enter with their own life and soul the tasks this time requires of them. Quote, Spirits ever watchful, guardians of their souls, May your vibrations drift to earthly humans committed to your charge, our souls petitioning love, that united with your power our prayer may helpfully radiate to the souls it lovingly seeks. And for those who because of these events have already passed through the gate of death, spirits ever watchful, guardians of their souls, May your vibrations drift to the humans of the spheres committed to your charge, our souls petitioning love, that united with your power, our prayer may helpfully radiate to the souls it lovingly seeks. The spirit we seek through deepening spiritual science, the spirit with whom we wish to unite, who descended onto earth and passed through earthly death for the salvation of humanity, for the healing, progress, and freedom of the earth, may he be at your side in all your difficult duties. After a long absence, I am able to be again in your midst, and I should like especially to devote the three lectures of this week to directing our gaze to a knowledge of the spiritual world which stands more or less in close connection with those significant and deeply incisive events of our time that touch us so deeply. We should not turn our attention immediately to the events themselves, but to what perhaps in everyone, in the feeling of us all, is connected with these events, like mysteries, like uneasy questions concerning human and cosmic destiny. We must turn our attention to this, to the wider destiny of the human soul, to which it is subject in the region of cosmic existence, toward which the gaze of spiritual science is also directed, not being limited to earthly material existence. We are very tempted now to knock at the door through which the human being passes when leaving this earthly body. We are urged toward that to which human beings can look up when they need a higher consolation, a deeper source of strength than can be obtained from material life. In how many ways does the voice of the spiritual world cry out in these times to our hearts, even to those who do not wish to penetrate the spiritual world, but whose hearts are, nevertheless, the windows into the spiritual world? How clearly and in how manifold a way does the spiritual world knock at these windows in our times? It is therefore fitting that we bring together again, from a special point of view, many matters that we can know about this spiritual world. One thing must be acknowledged by all those who transcend the narrow prejudices of materialism, biases that completely deny the existence of a spiritual world. The view of those who do not deny the existence of a spiritual world but merely maintain that human beings can learn nothing of it by human means goes somewhat further. 
if we do not take the position of absolute materialists, but have been ripened by life to admit at least the existence of a spiritual world, and this stage may soon be reached, even if such people were to deny the possibility of knowing anything of it, they are not far from the thought that whatever knowledge can be assimilated and whatever results can be acquired through the ordinary material world must be trivial indeed compared to what spreads out as a wider kingdom in the spiritual world behind the physical sensory world. Certainly today there are narrow-minded materialistic souls who would enclose the entire human being in such narrow limits that we would have to be regarded as little higher than the animals, belonging entirely to the animal evolution. Certainly there are such people. However, they will become fewer and fewer. As we have often seen, even natural science does not yet acknowledge these prejudices. Moreover, if we only begin by admitting that there is something in the human being that transcends external nature, very soon knowledge will arise of how trivial and limited is that which the physical sensory world embraces compared to the greatness and might of the whole universe. If we then study human beings and become conscious of what lives and can live in them, we must realize that no matter how far the spiritual world may extend, however great its kingdom, as human beings we are each a kind of microcosm in ourselves. However much we may govern, excuse me, consider it as unproven, in our being we nevertheless extend to the whole kingdom of the spiritual world to sensory perception, the depths of the soul into which the deeper parts of the spiritual world extend may be concealed, but they do extend into the human being. Human beings consist of more than the physical body or a combination of external physical forces and substances. We are also products of the entire cosmos, veritable microcosms. And much that we have worked for and sought was intended to show in detail how far humankind is a product of the spiritual world and show how far in us may be found not only the forces of this earth but also those of all the heavens. Once this thought is grasped, it will be clear that we can really know but very little of the human being through ordinary knowledge. Through conventional science, we know certain things about the laws of nature, knowledge we acquire between birth and death. However, even a little understanding of spiritual science, not enough to be called knowledge, but enough to shed light on life's mysteries, will make us realize that if we are to understand the human being, we must apply ourselves to something very different from the little external science that we can acquire between birth and death, through the external means of the body, through the external senses and the understanding bound to the brain. Now let us unite this thought with another, with the thought that goes as a main thread through all our considerations, the thought of repeated earthly lives. What probably most astonishes those who have busied themselves a little with our views is this thought of repeated earthly lives, and that the time that we pass here between birth and death is relatively so short, compared with the time that we pass in the spiritual world between death and rebirth. From many different points of view, we have stated that as a rule, the time that humans have to pass between death and rebirth is much, much longer than the relatively short time between birth and death here in physical life. There is a connection between the two thoughts that I have just expressed, that the little that we here acquire between birth and death in the way of knowledge and fruits of life stands to the spiritual wealth of the cosmos with which human beings are connected in about the same ratio as the short time between birth and death stands to the longer time between death and rebirth. 
for in reality it will occur to you from the many considerations that we have developed that it is the task of the human soul between death and rebirth to assimilate quite other knowledge and forces from those we acquire here in our physical life. Really, one can say, my dear friends, that when we enter physical earthly life, when we descend from the spiritual world and incarnate in the body given us by our ancestors through heredity, it is then our duty to have ready all the forces and all the fine ramifications of those forces that we require for the purpose of organizing this body of ours. You know that our body, as we receive it, is born of our parents. But with this body, our psychic spiritual being unites. And this being has previously passed a long time in the spiritual world between death and rebirth. Could one see, if one were for a moment justified in making the hypothesis, what external human beings can become merely through the forces of heredity, through the forces peculiar to the substance bestowed on us by our parents? We should see that with these forces alone human beings cannot become what they are. Through these forces that represent our external physical existence, and into these substances and groups or organs, we must pour what we as souls bring into the form that we receive from our parents. And out of the abstract soul substance, we form the individual person we are. As I have said, it is a foolish hypothesis, but we may make use of it to make things clear. Let us think for once what might have arisen if you all were merely born of your parents. Let us leave karma out of consideration and leave out of account the fact that we are, of course, born into definite families and let us only regard physical heredity. Then you would all be alike as human beings. You would only have the general human physical character that you are quite definite individuals, that so many individual beings sit here before us, rests on the fact that the general human form, even in its finest principles, is fashioned by the spiritual individuality that descends from the spiritual world and enters into what is given by father and mother. To that end, just as we must have fingers to grasp an object in the physical world, just as we must perceive an object in order to grasp it, even as we must have the necessary organs and also must have learned to grasp a thing, so must we have learned to attach ourselves to all the different organs that form our body physically. We have all got ears, but we each hear in our own way. We all have eyes, but we see individually. For the external organs, this is least perceptible. In the inner behavior of a human being it is more striking. Thus we must insert our psychic spiritual essence into all these quite general organs and fashion them individually. We must come to know the forces, the inner soul spiritual formations, so that what we receive through inheritance as ears, nose, eyes, brain, and so on, we can fashion individually. That means that when we enter the physical world at birth, we must have knowledge, and not just knowledge, but also practical possibilities of using it. This wonderful structure of the human being, how little do we really know of it through external science? We must inwardly learn the whole subtle structure of the brain, because we have to organize it inwardly. And all these spiritual psychic processes, everything that makes it at all possible for us to be human in a human body between birth and death, all this we have to acquire for ourselves. Just as we have to acquire abilities for ourselves in life, so we must also acquire between death and rebirth the power of being humans in physical life. We must keep this in view. It must be quite clear to us 
and then we shall be able to form an idea of what we do not know of humanity through mere physical knowledge. But that we must realize through that other knowledge that we have to assimilate in a practical form between death and rebirth. But we know that what we call, excuse me, that what we shall assimilate between death and rebirth is built on to all that we have assimilated in earlier lives on earth. And so, just as in a certain sense our physical life here is regulated between birth and death, so too is our life between death and rebirth regulated. We enter physical life as if half asleep and dreaming as small children. We cannot immediately develop memory, a development we must first learn. If, however, we examine things more closely, we find that during the time before we develop memory, we acquire certain relations to the outer world. The child first gropes and then learns to grasp. Thus certain things are acquired systematically. The child learns much during this time, much more than is usually supposed. Then again each single epoch of life so runs its course that the later epochs are based on the earlier ones. Not only is the structural formation of a person built up here between birth and death, but a life also. And this life between death and rebirth is similarly ruled and regulated. In this respect, to become aware of how regulated this life of ours is, we need only bring to mind one thing that we have long known. We have often emphasized the fact that for our soul life here in physical existence, we need a conception of our I capital which once acquired in the second, third, and fourth year of life, that time to which we can go back in memory, should never leave us. In a person with whom to a certain extent this I connection is broken, a disturbance of the soul's equilibrium takes place. There are such people, as I have often mentioned, but they are really suffering from a severe psychic illness. It may happen that a man is suddenly torn away from the connection with his I. He does not remember his earlier life. He may, for instance, go to the station and buy a ticket for some place or another. His reason functions quite normally. At the intervening stations, he does everything necessary in quite a reasonable way. However, he does not remember anything that previously took place. His inner life only extends to the point when he resolved to buy a ticket and make the journey. He travels all over the world with his mind and reason in order. Then comes a moment when he knows he is he. Until then his soul life was extinguished as regards memory. The understanding may be in order, although the memory is extinguished. The I is wrenched away and the man suffers from a severe psychic illness. I myself had an acquaintance who, while occupying a relatively high post, was suddenly seized by such an illness. He had the impulse to travel, after having forgotten everything about himself and who he was. He travelled, as one might say, blindly through the world from one place to the other, and found himself again in his native city, in an asylum for the homeless. Then it suddenly came back to him who he was. The interval was passed quite rationally, but was not connected with the rest of his life. The illness befell him a second time, but this time he committed suicide, while still in that state of consciousness in which the memory was dissociated from the eye. Now you see, just as in the life between birth and death, the eye must be a continuous thread, which may not at any time during daily life lose the possibility of remembering what has happened since that point in childhood to which one can go back? So must it be also in the life between death and rebirth. There, too, we must always have the possibility of preserving our I. Now, this possibility is given us, and it is given us through the fact that the first days after death 
are passed in the manner we have often described. Immediately after death people have before them, as in a mighty picture, the life that has just run its course. For several days they go back over their whole past life, but always so that the whole life is there before them, as in a great panorama. Now, of course, if observed more closely, it turns out that these days in their review of the past life, they are, as it were, endowed with a certain power of observation. In a sense, we regard the life during these days from the perspective of the eye. We see in particular everything in which our eye was interested. We see the relations that we have with certain people, but we see them in a connection with the results we ourselves obtained from them. Thus we do not regard things quite objectively, but see all that has borne fruit for us. Human beings see themselves everywhere as the center, and that is extremely necessary. For from these days when they thus see everything that has been fruitful for them, arise that inner strength and force that they need in the whole of their life between death and rebirth, in order there to be able firmly to retain the thought of the eye. For we owe the power of being able to retain the eye between death and rebirth to this vision of the last life. The power to do so really proceeds from this. I must especially emphasize this again, even though I have said it before. The moment of death is of extraordinary significance. Death is something that most distinctly has two totally different aspects. Regarded here from the physical world, it certainly has many sad aspects, many painful sides. However, here we really see death only from the one side. After our death, we see it from the other. It is then the most satisfying and most perfect occurrence that we can possibly experience, for there it is a living fact. Whereas here death is a proof of how frail and transitory the human physical life is, when seen from the spiritual world, it is actually a proof that the spirit continually wins the victory over everything non-spiritual, that the spirit is ever the life, the eternal, ever unconquerable life. Death is precisely the proof that in reality there is no death, that death is maya, or illusion. Herein is the great difference between the life from death to rebirth and our life here from birth to death. As you know, with ordinary physical means of cognition, people cannot remember their own birth. They cannot prove their own birth by means of personal experience, because they have not witnessed it themselves. Birth is something that cannot be seen by the human eye, EYE, here in physical life. It exists before the time that we are able to remember. Birth is never included in our recollection. Death, however, and it is thereby distinguished from birth as regards its significance after death, stands before our spiritual vision as the greatest, most significant, living and perfect event in our life between death and rebirth. For death is precisely the means by which we retain our I, capital, consciousness, after death. And just as little as it is possible in physical life to remember our birth, is it necessary and self-evident in the life between death and rebirth that the great moment when the spirit separates from the body should, during the whole time we pass in the spiritual world, always stand before our psychic spiritual gaze. For from this death flows to us, in connection with what we have experienced here, the force we need to feel ourselves as I, capital. We might say, quote, if we were unable to die, we could never experience a spiritual I. For we owe the possibility of experiencing a spiritual eye to the fact that we can die physically. Close quote. Thus, 
lay the facts for our eye. The eye is strengthened and invigorated through our experiencing those first days after death, in which we are still within our etheric body. Then the etheric body is laid aside, and we experience retrospectively the preceding life. This we call the passage of the human soul through the soul world, a life lasting longer than that shorter life that lasts only a few days and that immediately follows physical death. Now, the opinion is very prevalent that a person who can look into the spiritual world immediately beholds everything. I have often corrected this. Nothing produces such humility as true insight into the spiritual world. For one may look for a very long time, and the investigation of the single facts of the spiritual world is really a long, long labor, and is accomplished by means of forces of the spiritual world. It is mere prejudice to believe that anyone who looks into the spiritual world can immediately give information about everything. Just as here in the physical world things are investigated gradually in the course of time, so is it in the spiritual life. Things have to be investigated little by little. And now I should like to touch on a point that must appear important to some of those here present. That is, the absolute agreement of the different spiritual facts as they gradually come to light, as they continually arise in new forms. Even to those who do not yet see into the spiritual world, this may be a proof of the truth of that for which a true and genuine investigation is striving. In my title, Outline of Esoteric Science, I have given from different perspectives a definite time to the periods of the life between death and rebirth. I would now like to present yet another perspective that I did not quote in An Outline of Esoteric Science for a simple reason, which I will not conceal from you, so that you may see that spiritual science is striven for here in an honorable and upright manner. For the simple reason that at that time I did not yet know these facts myself, but was only able to discover them later. There is a certain connection between the spiritual life that can be developed here on the physical plane and the spiritual life between death and rebirth. You already know that we pass our physical life here in waking and sleeping. On the one hand, we have a full consciousness in the waking state, and then for the normal person an unconscious condition sets in, in the time between sleeping and waking. Now you know also, from what has been set forth in titled How to Know Higher Worlds, that this sleep life may be lit up by consciousness, that it is possible to look into what happens between falling asleep and waking up. If we can attain this and learn more and more of the life that the human being passes here in sleep, we really learn to know an amazing kingdom of life. In this unconscious condition between falling asleep and waking up, a vast and amazing kingdom of human life flows by unperceived by the normal human existence. A great deal goes on then. And what very soon strikes us in this sleep life is that it is much more active than the life between waking and sleeping. During sleep we are within our eye and astral body and have, as it were, our physical body and etheric body outside us. Now, even this external life is an active one, with many people a very active life indeed. It appears so active to us because we do not take all the inactivity that exists in this outer life much into consideration. Really, if everything in this external life had to proceed from our own initiative, we should be greatly astonished by how differently everything would take place. Just consider, you get up every morning. You hardly form the resolution to get up. You do it from habit. 
and you do not really come to a closer knowledge of what it signifies to be so connected with the whole cosmic ordering that you pass your life at definite times in one or other of these two conditions of waking and sleeping and have to regulate your life accordingly. How many people think of this? It all goes on as a matter of course. Now, try for once to consider how much goes on in this way. So that in a sense we go through life like automata. You will then come to recognize that there is a great deal more inactivity in the life between waking and falling asleep, but great activity in the life between sleeping and waking. There is a complete and tremendous activity, excuse me, there a complete and tremendous activity takes place. It is an interesting fact that people who are relatively indolent in external life, between waking and sleeping, are the busiest between sleeping and waking. Human beings are then extremely active, only they know nothing of this in ordinary life. If we examine more closely what drives the soul, that is, the eye and astral body, we find that this activity is really intimately connected with the whole existence of humanity. Though in our journey through life we consciously take but very little of it with us. We do not work upon all our life as it approaches us externally. I should like to give an apt instance of this. Just consider, you are now hearing this lecture, which lasts perhaps one hour. Really, without wishing to offend any of the dear friends sitting here, I may say that it would be possible to hear infinitely more in the words of this lecture than the different friends sitting here are hearing. Indeed, it would be possible to gather much more from all I am saying than I know myself. But what I mean is this, and I am only saying this in illustration of the above. You will go home presently, go to bed and sleep, and wake up tomorrow morning. And in the time between your sleeping and waking, quite unconsciously, of course, as regards the normal consciousness, you will work upon much of what you are now in a position to hear. You will work upon it a great deal in your next sleep, and perhaps also during the following nights. One sees souls laboring between sleeping and waking in quite a different fashion at what they have absorbed. And even if it occurred that some had listened very inattentively and had merely been somewhat receptive, yet through that receptivity they would draw into their souls the spiritual powers and impulse in the lecture. And that would be worked upon during sleep and transformed into what we require not only for the rest of life up till death, but beyond death. This Excuse me. Thus we work over our whole life as it transpires by day between our waking and sleeping. Everything we experience by day we work upon during the night. Thus we learn lessons, as it were, that we need for all the rest of our life here and beyond death into the next incarnation. When we are asleep we are our own prophetic transmuters of our life. This sleep life is full of tremendously deep mysteries, for it is much more deeply connected with what we experience than is the external consciousness, and we work at it all from the perspective of its fruitfulness for the following life. What we can make of ourselves through what we have experienced is the object of our labor in the time between sleeping and waking. Whether we become stronger and more powerful in our soul, or perhaps have to reproach ourselves, we labor at all our experiences so that they become life fruit. You see from this that the life between sleeping and waking is really enormously significant, and that it goes deeply into the whole mystery of humanity. Now, perhaps one day, spiritual investigators will form the intention we may even say the purpose, of comparing this life of sleep with another 
a supersensible life, and decide to compare it with those days that take their course during the life of Kamaloka. Note here that although this can be seen only by clairvoyance, in life we can recollect all that we have experienced in our daily life. But after death, after the time of the life tableau has passed, we obtain a memory of all our nights. This is an important secret that is revealed to us. This is an important secret that is revealed to us. We remember all our night life. This review presents itself so that we really live in reverse, beginning from the last night passed here in life, proceeding to the pre- proceeding to the preceding one, and so on. Thus we re-experience our whole life backward, but as seen from the night aspect. One experiences again in this retrospective recollection what one has unconsciously thought and investigated. One really goes back through one's life, but not from the day aspect. How long does that last approximately? Now remember that we sleep away about one-third of our life. As you know, there are people who naturally sleep much more. However, on average, we sleep away a third of our lives. Therefore, the retrospective also lasts about one-third of our earthly life because we experience the nights. Just think how wonderfully that agrees with the other points of view that have been elucidated. We have always said that the life in Kamaloka lasts about one-third of a person's life. When we take all this into consideration, we see again that it must be a third. Thus, these things harmonize. The details always fit, which is the wonderful thing about spiritual investigation. We learn a fact, and once that is settled, we immediately learn it again from another perspective. It is always like the case when people climb a hill from which they are they see something first from one side and then from another, yet the essential points remain the same. Thus they can say, here in earthly life, between birth and death, our life is so experienced that it is always torn away from us, it is always broken off by night time, and we remember only our daytime experiences. But during the night we do more than remember them, we work on and transform them, as said earlier. What we cannot remember now, we remember during our life in Kamaloka. That is an important connection. And from this you will grasp much that could not perhaps be understood otherwise. Just consider, especially today, how many relatively young men pass through the gates of death. I already stated from numerous perspectives how significant this is for the collective life of humanity. However, let us look first at the two divisions that we have just described. We will come to other things in the course of these lectures. Let us consider the life in the etheric body, which lasts only a few days, during which people have their life tableau before them. And then we shall consider the life of the soul in the soul world. Going through the previous life from the night side, We shall easily be able to see why the spiritual investigator must say that even these two periods of life between death and rebirth are different for a person who has gone relatively early through the gates of death. One who dies at a later age has different experiences. This concerns us very closely because so many now are dying at a relatively early age. You see, it is really the case that the separate sections that I have distinguished are of great significance for our life here in the physical world. I have given these divisions of life thus. The first extends to the seventh year, to the change in dentition. The next to the fourteenth year, the time of puberty. Another extends to the twenty-first year, and so on, in periods of seven years. And if you earnestly consider what lies in these phases of life, you will see that the thirty-fifth year becomes an important epoch. Till then, we are, as it were, in a state of preparation. 
whereas later we have ended the preparatory stage and built up our life on the basis of what has been prepared up to the 35th year. This 35th year of life is of very great significance. Till then, not merely the bodily growth continues, but also the growth of the soul. For the soul of a person really grows. Now it must decidedly be emphasized that much of the ripened condition of life can only be attained after the 35th year. If we consider this 35th year of life from another point of view, it will appear still more significant to us. You see, if we place these seven-year epochs of life before the soul, we first have the building up of the physical body to the age of seven and the building up of the etheric body to the age of fourteen. From the fourteenth to the twenty-first year there is fashioned and organized what we call the astral body, then the sentient soul to the age of twenty-eight, the rational or intellectual soul to the age of thirty-five, and the self-conscious or spiritual soul to the age of forty-two. Then we come to spirit self, which is a kind of evolving back again to the astral body, and so on. The further epochs of life do not progress in periods of seven years, but irregularly, for they will only evolve to regularity in the future. Thus, unless thwarted by the errors of education, a certain regularity is followed up to the thirty-fifth year. Now, we may be especially struck by the deeper significance of the entire development of life when we observe people who die at these different epochs of life. Suppose, merely as an instance, that we follow the soul of an 11, 12 or 13 year old boy or girl who goes through the gate of death at such an early age. In keeping with what I have described, in such cases it follows that the etheric body which in theory would have been able to care for the full life of the child, still has those unused forces within it. Generally, during the whole of life, between birth and death, human beings actually prepare themselves for death. They really make themselves ready for death. In fact, our whole life is a preparation for death, insofar as we continually work on the destruction of the body. If we could not destroy it, we would never attain perfection, for we pay for perfection, as it were, by destroying the outer physical body. Now, when a boy of thirteen goes through the gate of death, he has not accomplished the long work of destruction that he might have otherwise been able to do. He has not fulfilled everything he might have done. This expresses itself in a noteworthy way. If we follow such a soul, we find it in the spiritual world after a certain time, a relatively short time, between death and rebirth, in what I might call a most remarkable society. We find it among souls who are preparing themselves for their next life, so that they will soon have to descend again to earth. These are the souls who will quickly incarnate. Among these, then, live the souls who pass through the gate of death at the age of eleven, twelve, or thirteen. They are placed among them. Moreover, if we look more closely into these connections, it turns out, oddly enough, that the souls who will soon enter their earthly life need what those other souls can bring to them from earth to give them the strength they need to enter a physical body. Thus, the souls of the young form a strong source of help to those others who must soon descend to the earth. Young children who are quite normal, who have no prominent spiritual life, but are merely intelligent, are normally able to give certain assistance, which can no longer be given by one who dies in later years. They too have their task. All must accommodate themselves to their own karma, and we should not on this account wish to die at this or that age, for we all die at the age permitted by our karma. Thus the help a soul can offer to the souls awaiting incarnation 
cannot be given by one who dies in later years. That rests in the fact that during the first half of life a soul stands nearer to the entire spiritual world in one sense than in the second half of life. Yet in another sense this is not the case. But in a certain sense we do stand nearer to the spiritual world in the first half of our life. In fact, the whole life so runs its course that the longer we live in the physical body, the further we are from the spiritual world. Children of one year still stand very close to the spiritual world. When they forsake the physical plane, they are soon in the spiritual world. This is the case up to the fourteenth year. Till then, children so live in the physical body that they can easily enter the world of souls who are seeking an early incarnation. This is connected with the fact that even in the tableau, one who dies very young has different experiences from those who die in later life. Thus the thirty-fifth year of life is an important boundary. Those who die before the thirty-fifth year first experience the life tableau and then go backward through the night life. But during this entire experience of the spiritual world, they see, as it were, quote, through a glass darkly, close quote, as if they were seeing it through the life pictures, that spiritual world that they forsook on being born. Their perspective still extends to the spiritual world. But if they have passed this 35th year, then it is quite different. They no longer behold that wherein they themselves were before birth. That is one of those things that particularly strikes one now when so many die young. Because looking back at the spiritual world still retains a certain significance up to the 35th year. Of course, after the 14th, 15th or 16th year, it is no longer such a direct vision. But even from then on, but even from then until the 35th year, If death occurs, it's as if the spiritual life were reflected everywhere in the retrospective life picture. If one dies during infancy, there is of course not much life experience to review. Such a one can look into the spiritual world almost immediately. When children die at the age of 13, they have a retrospective tableau, but immediately behind that lies the spiritual world they can still see the spiritual world clearly. When death occurs later, the spiritual world is not perceived as distinctly. Rather, it is contained in what is seen as one's own life. Until the thirty-fifth year we remain connected with that spiritual world from which we descended. Those who die before the age of thirty-five experience even during the first period of the life in which they see the life picture and then in the retrospective journey through the soul world that they really are in a kind of homeland that they forsook at birth. They have the direct feeling of coming back home into the world from which they descended. This is of tremendous importance. For each one who dies thus is in one sense as you see immediately placed more easily into the spiritual world than one who dies later. Out of their post-mortem survey they carry far more spirituality into their next life between birth and death. And those young men who die in such numbers in our present age will, from this perspective, become important bearers of spiritual truths and spiritual knowledge when they descend to earth again in their next incarnation. Thus we see that the terrible suffering that is poured over the world is nevertheless necessary for the course of existence as a whole. For the blood that now flows will be the symbol of a certain refreshing of spiritual life at a particular time in the future, and this is necessary for the whole evolution of humanity. Then will the souls who now go through the gate of death so early descend again but most of them will descend differently from how they would have had they would have had they reached the limits of life and material existence and then died it is cosmic wisdom that now calls away a number of souls so they may be allowed to perceive even in their retrospective tableau 
and experiences deep spiritual secrets connected with the earth. That, too, is cosmic wisdom. For these souls are thus filled with what they will behold in stronger form when they come to see it again. They will have been strengthened by the shorter earthly life that they have undergone. That is the true wisdom of the cosmos. Therefore we must say that much of what rightly gives us pain when we are only able to regard it from the perspective of earthly existence shows us its redeeming side when we observe it from the perspective of spiritual vision. Thus it is with the whole of life. Certainly, my dear friends, earthly pain cannot be at present avoided through such a consideration. It must be experienced. That is the very condition for its compensation. If we did not experience it in the physical world, it could never be compensated. But although we must suffer many things in the physical world, there are, nevertheless, moments in which we can place ourselves at the perspective of the spiritual. Then we shall recognize that much of what must appear to us as painful from a lower point of view is a tribute that must be offered to the higher spiritual worlds and the wise beings therein, in order that the evolution of the whole cosmos and of human existence may go forward, not in a one-sided way, but in every direction. The expiation for much suffering must be achieved, and to this end the suffering itself must first be endured. Spiritual science cannot indeed spare us that, but it can teach us to lay it on the altar of existence, to seek the compensation and to recognize the wisdom of the cosmos in spite of all the pain that for higher ends it must cause. This is what spiritual science can give us as a precious unction for the whole human existence. Thus, from this this perspective also, and right from the feelings that spiritual science can arouse in us. Let us regard the powerful events of our time and say again what we have often repeated here, quote, from the fighter's courage, from the blood of battles, from the mourner's suffering, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruits of spirit, if with consciousness the soul turns her thought to spirit realms. The end of Lecture 1